Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our panel discussion for cryptography in a quantum computing world, asking the question, will our data be safe? We are joined today by two of the uh, world's most prominent experts in cryptography and quantum computing, computing respectively, Dr. Tahir Elgamal, who is the CTO of Salesforce, and Dr. Michaela Mosca, who is the founder of the Institute for Quantum Computing and a professor in the Department of Combinatorics and Optimizations at the University of Waterloo. Uh, they are the experts who will speak, be speaking. My name is Greg Hoffer. I am simply a practitioner of cryptography. I deal with software that uses cryptography to securely move files around. I will be moderating the discussion so that we can get some great information out of these two wonderful gentlemen. Um, okay. So if we are ready to go, let's start out with you, Dr. Mosco. Can you give us a brief overview of where we're at in this world of quantum computing? And uh, is it a real thing now? Uh, and how does it, what does it do as it, it relates to quantum cryptography and the threats to it, the benefits, et cetera? Yeah, so, you know, back in the mid nineties, I initially thought it, literally thought it was a joke. And then when I realized People were actually serious about this. I thought it was ridiculous. And then I, you know, studied it a bit more and realized I was wrong. And eventually it would, it would work. Uh, but in 1996, I, on my master's thesis, during my master's thesis exam, I was urged to say, when are we going to have that? I said, not for 20 years. I said, in 20 years, we're going to have 20 qubits. And then it'll become clear what it'll look like. Uh, and I think a lot of people thought I was being pessimistic. Uh, but, you know, um, a lot has happened in those 20, well, now 25 years, uh, because for the first 10, 20 years of the field, there was almost two different communities, not completely. People trying to figure out what you would do with these devices, should we have them? And people working on the building blocks of the building blocks to build these devices, right? Uh, but that is, we're in a new era now. We already have devices that you can't, because up until two years ago, I could always say whatever you've built, I could simulate just as well on a laptop. <clears throat> so, not to discourage you, not not I know what you know what's been done is amazing, <clears throat> but in terms of practical commercial use, I could do that on a laptop, <clears throat> with the exception potentially of annealing, quantum annealing, because that's a somewhat different architecture. <clears throat> but for the circuit-based quantum computing models, but that's not the case anymore. We're already into the many dozens of, of physical quantum bits, and we can't just easily simulate on a laptop. That doesn't mean it's useful for anything, right? Uh, unless you happen to care what 70 or so quantum bits are doing, uh, the behavior of, you know, so many bits. But we're, another thing that's been happening in the last is we're at a, you know, I think convergence of a number of things. Industry, now there's many, many players. Again, for the first few decades, the people who had the real world problems weren't wasting their time figuring out what this computing platform that didn't exist yet could do to help. And the people working in quantum computing, well, they don't have the, the deep knowledge of the, of the real, you know, real world hard optimization problems. But that's changing. Now, in the last year, like it's, it's really happening, expanding aggressively in real time. People are seriously exploring what quantum computers might be good for. And still, perhaps, you know, the chance of it actually being useful for a commercial problem now, and with the exception of annealing, perhaps, is small, not zero. But we're starting to finally bring these two worlds together. Uh, now, it may be that these noisy, intermediate-scale quantum computers, when we get, they get slightly bigger and slightly better, are useful. But the next big milestone, and the one that's relevant for cryptography, is finally getting a device that can correct those quantum errors. Because when you can correct those quantum errors, you now have a robust, logical level quantum bit. And we know if you have about 4,000 of those, you can break RSA 2048. So the next, the, the milestone that matters the most for cybersecurity and for many, most of the real world applications of quantum computing is getting this fault tolerant, logical quantum bit. It's like finally having a vacuum tube bit that works. And then we'll then we'll migrate into scaling them. And you have only four thousand of them. You already break the foundations of public key cryptography today. So that's yeah, so that's. Today. I think that's an amazing point. So let's let's pause there and make sure we're all on the same page with what you just said. So RSA is a venerable uh, one of the first, right? The public 
key crypto algorithm that allows people to exchange data securely without pre-shared secrets. It was an amazing advancement by the three gentlemen back in 77, I believe. And it's lasted this long to protect our information from prying eyes. Um, but what you're saying is that the basis on which that cryptography uh, is made real, the prime factorization, the challenges and the mathematics behind it, they can be um, much more easily overcome in a quantum computing world. Is that stating it right? Exactly. And, you know, going to a bigger key isn't really a good solution because normally if you add a small, a constant, now like two, three bits to your key length, you've doubled the work the adversary has to do. And if you want to really annoy them, you add 20 extra bits, right? And, and not, you know, you've just made it thousands and thousands of times harder to break your scheme. But now, because the complexity of breaking the scheme is about the same as using it, you know, you can double your, you can double their work, but you have to double your work too. So it, going to larger keys is not a viable option because you never really know. First of all, you assume your adversary has more computing power than you. So you can't go to larger keys. You really need a new algorithm that reestablishes the status quo. And there's an exponential gap between using the system and breaking it. Excellent. And do you have any ideas or, uh, looking into your magic crystal ball, how yeah. what do you assess as the risk of realistic quantum computing having 4,000 bits, qubits, or you know, yeah. what's the timeline we should be looking at? Yeah, and I think risk is the right language to use because it's absolutely useless in practice to say, I don't think this is going to happen in five years or 10 years because I don't think you know the COVID-19 vaccine is going to kill me. But if somebody says, so if somebody says, oh, it's, it's safe because 75% of experts say it's less than 1% likely to kill you and the other 25% says more than 1%, that's not reassuring, for, you know, so it really right. depends on your risk tolerance, right? And so, and I've studied this myself, I think the chance of it have a quantum cryptanalysis of RSA 2048 in five years is still small, but more than 1%. And I think it's more than 20% in a decade. Right. I think it's more likely than not in, in 13, 14 years. And we surveyed thought leaders, 44 thought leaders from all around the world. And, and, and so those are the kind, you know, that's roughly, uh, there's no consensus. You'll see a spectrum, but you can kind of look at the middle and it, it's more or less consistent with what I just told you now, where the risk of it happening in 10 years, even for a very, very critical system, the five-year risk is already uncomfortable, let's say. And the you know twenty percent chance, and even if you say I think it's five percent, fine, uh, it's still an unacceptable risk for our critical infrastructures. For again, it's not just about it's not just like one meat processing company going down for a few days. It's not just one pipeline going down. It's not just one water facility getting poisoned, it's, it, and then getting going back up in a week. It's systemic. It's not. A small percentage of systems it's all it's a large fraction of systems going down with no quick fix in mind so it's an unacceptable risk today right i think that's a great observation and that's one big key takeaway that everyone should take from this panel right we are assuming uh assuming is the wrong word we are looking at a some level of risk associated with uh quantum computing advancing sufficiently within the next five years, a greater risk within 10 years that all our existing crypto systems are broken. Yeah, and crypto <laughs> systems a little more color if I can. Yeah. So it's basically the next, the, the last major harbinger, right, is the demonstration of this logical quantum bit. Because then you're in a scaling game, right? Uh, and IBM says they're going to achieve that in 2023, right? And our experts, 30 out of 44 said, it's about 50% likely or more likely within three years. And that was from last summer. So again, we're looking at, you know, mid 2023 is, we don't know for certain, but there's a really serious likelihood. And then it's really a, well, really, it's mostly a scaling game. So uh, it, 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 this is, um, you know, a palpable risk. Hey, if, if you don't mind, um, that does not include entities that are developing quantum computers that we do not know about the product <laughs> information. Yeah. And, you know, uh, IBM and, and Google and so on have budgets and they invest in things for reasons. But there are entities that just like to invest because they have reasons to invest that we may or may not know. 
So, 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 you know, in general, the time frame is is kind of a guess at this point. It's generally agreed upon. Uh, you know, people argue over ten or fifteen years, or five or ten years, and that kind of thing. Um, but there are progress being made on building these quantum computers that are actually outside of things that we know. All right, it's a good point, Dr. Algamal, and I was actually just taking that note. Who who knows what? Uh, adversarial nation states are doing in their investments, which wouldn't be publicly disclosed, or uh, even private investors with a wealth of money that just want to come up with adversarial systems. We we just don't know. Uh, so, Dr. Elgamal, let's turn it back to you. We we know that cryptography is an important part of our modern world. We're all used to using HTTPS in our browsers, not HTTP. We know that um, we should have strong authentication with two-factor. So we're familiar with some of this cryptography stuff, but really cryptography underpins a lot of our business transactions or consumer transactions. It ranges from authentication to message integrity, signatures on messages, the privacy of the data. So can you talk a little bit about what this threat that uh, Dr. Mosca has mentioned, what does that mean to people in cryptography? Um, what should we be aware of as the highest priority? Uh, people in cryptography is actually a very small number of people. I, I'd rather talk about how would the general public deal with this. Yeah, please. Um, you know, so we we use cryptography as basically the very first uh, methods to secure transactions over an open network. About the same time, Dr. Mosca was. Uh, was getting his master's degree. Uh, and, you know, we we designed it in a way that was not very scalable. So, so there is issue number one, which is we built RSA as the root. We made RSA the root certificate. And we actually knew, we sat in a room and we knew that if RSA got broken, all of e-commerce goes down. It is not a lot of machines. It's literally all of e-commerce goes down. I'm not... I'm not the alarmist person, uh, sort of personally, but technically we had opportunities to double find things, for example, where you can replace signature algorithms. Now, it turns out that if you had replaced RSA with ECC, we would be exactly in the same boat, uh, but we would have a mechanism of replacing, which is actually the biggest issue, I think, that the, the digital economy is going to face over the next 10, 15 years, maybe five, according to Michele here. And just to clarify, Dr. Elgamal, what we're talking about, RSA typically is with certificates to uh, strongly identify both the server side and possibly the client side of information exchanges. And RSA is an algorithm that allows these two sides to create secure cryptographic communications without pre-shared secrets. It just, it just works, right? You don't have to pre-establish something to make those channels secure. Uh, yeah. Can you describe what's, briefly what ECC is for the audience? Yeah, it's it's what's under the lock and in, in the in the button, right, and in, in, in the browser. Uh, that that's what's under it. It's it's an RSA negotiation that SSL, which is now called TLS, does. Uh, ECC is elliptic curve cryptography, which was developed in a similar time frame. It was we knew actually about it back then, so it's not like we did not know. Uh, but, you know, it was viewed as too expensive to try to double sign uh, to protect against the risk of, of, of one of these algorithms getting actually broken. So, so the advice we give people now is we will have to change cryptographic algorithms. Uh, I don't think this is uh, an if. I think it's a when. And I think the hardest thing, and if you listen... To, to NIST, so NIST is taking on the task of, you know, let's develop a standard of a number of algorithms, not necessarily one, that are resilient to, to the quantum attack, the Shor algorithm. Um, and, you know, we believe in two to four years or so, we will have these standards. There's, there's, there's a meeting next week, actually, to discuss the third round um uh, algorithms that you know will be recommended uh changing all of e-commerce is a very large task because e-commerce is actually not owned by anyone it's it's part of the internet the beauty of it is that it just runs everywhere so, so you know the browser vendors are obviously 
taken uh, you know good care of of things and they actually participated in this a number of the algorithms that were proposed came from browser vendors uh, and then all of the servers will have to migrate so we have to call every single business that does that conduct business online i do not know any business that does not conduct business online these days um to actually make sure they have a, a migration plan this is not about changing an algorithm uh, because the new algorithms appear to have very different characteristics they have larger keys for example they have different behaviors and you know knowing how software gets developed it, it's likely that things will break so, so we need a, a migration plan and if if you're like many other businesses you probably have more than one customer and the customers are gonna migrate at different time frames so, so you know you're gonna have rsa and or elliptic curve cryptography things running uh, on on some links to maybe internally maybe between customers and then you're developing this new thing that runs the new algorithms. And I think everybody will need to run um, a combination of these, which I do not know of any system that is capable of doing this at this point in time. Uh, I know there is research and, and that kind of thing. So we have to just take notice of what's happening in the world. Migration, in my opinion, will be the toughest task. And I talk to you know large banks, I talk to uh, telcos and people like that and they all know this is happening and they're kind of starting to think about what migration looks like uh you know the bank uh, and i'm not identifying which one because i talked to several probably will take five to ten years to actually migrate which is similar time frame to to, to the time frame that michael was talking about uh so, so you know, we urge people to start to put plans together to, to just test things and work with some partners on, you know, how this is gonna go and so on and so forth. So uh, that's kind of scary just, just to restate this, especially as we consider this payments industry, the conference that we're at, payments are very much based upon the security of the information, both at the point of sales, all the way to the, the vendor, to the bank, to the cash, to the, I mean, just everything has to be secure, authenticated. You want to reduce fraud. You want to ensure confidentiality and authentication of the information. So crypto is vital to the payments industry. Um, and it sounds like there is going to be a massive amount of work over the next five to 10 years. How do we start? If you don't mind, we should just make something clear. These are the public key cryptography algorithms that e-commerce online existence actually uses. Uh, the effect on symmetric cryptography, which is, you know, the two sides share the same key, is not nearly the same. So we might have to update a little bit, but the danger to an AES uh, algorithm is not like an RSA or an elliptic curve algorithm. So, so we don't want everybody in the world to kind of understand cryptography to the greatest detail because there's honestly no reason to. But it is not true that every cryptographic link will be broken because there okay. are cryptographic, cryptographic links that use a symmetric cryptography. And these are going to live much longer. Very good. Thank you for that. And so, Dr. Mosca, what do you see as the effect of... Oh, well, first, feel free to comment on Dr. Elgamal's stuff. But with respect to cryptography, especially as we're talking about payment systems, the public key is at risk. Um, what about quantum's effect on this symmetric cryptography, the, the stuff that happens after you've exchanged some secret material so that the two parties can uh, talk securely. Yeah, I mean, 100% agree with uh, Tahir. So, and I put, I mean, no, so we were much, much more concerned about the asymmetric crypto, the public key crypto, which is used to authenticate, to sign things, so all your auto updates every day, you need them, because if you don't, then there's vulnerable security flaws that people can exploit. But if, if the code isn't authentic, well, then that'll get you because then you're downloading malware. So you, you need it for both the authentication. So it's not about keeping secrets. It's just to trust who you're talking to and that code is authentic and so on. And we use it to establish the keys, which we then use in AES encryption, for example. It is now. So first of all, 
how long did it take banks to translate go from DES to AES, right? Or from SHA-1 to SHA-2. So easier said than done, you know. If, if they have, by the way, yeah, asterisk right. there. If so they and, have. and most haven't yet, actually. Yeah. So we're framing that as, oh, that's not so hard. But in the real world, you know, it, it's, it's easier said than done. But the public key migration is much more complicated. There's huge, like, DES and AES, the problem wasn't perform wasn't like you know performance. It wasn't like, oh AES is too cumbersome. It was like, no, we just have to change one thing with another thing that is almost exactly the same. And that takes years. So but now we're talking about different keys. To, you know, it's much more, you know, performance, different signing times are different, bandwidth is different, and so on. So it's a much more complicated thing. <clears throat> there are some systems that don't use asymmetric crypto. Um, mm -hmm. Those tend to be much more cumbersome to me. They're, and they're, you know, some are, uh, they, they need more, you have to rely more on trust or human intervention. So by all means, we're going to keep using those things. Uh, I'm, I'd be very nervous about taking a system that now benefits from asymmetric crypto and saying, well, let's just, you know, trans migrate it all to symmetric crypto only. Because uh, first of all, it probably won't work in the real world. <clears throat> Uh, just just go look up Sweet A on the Wikipedia page. It's not it's not easy uh, to maintain you know, uh, you know these sorts of um, symmetric type systems. And secondly, you, you're going to rely more on trust. And we're trying to move to a world where we trust less, right? Uh, so I, I think we definitely want to migrate to a world with strong asymmetric cryptography that's agile, as Tahir mentioned, where it's easy to upgrade. Let's design the agility in instead of continuing to relive the scenario of you know, we bake in the new algorithm and then have to go through a very complicated, much longer than it needs to be processed to upgrade. Um, so, I, so that's a sort of uh, my long version of uh, I agree uh, that that you know symmetric key crypto is probably okay, uh, but it, you know we've done quantum risk analyses and often people say, oh, I don't know, I just use symmetric crypto, and we're like, oh, okay. And we go and look, and there's public key everywhere, you know, uh, the way the backups are managed, how the way access is controlled, the way updates are like, so you really have to do a full, you know, thorough risk assessment uh, and see where, you know, where you are vulnerable directly or indirectly to, uh, to a compromise of public key cryptography. Well, that's excellent. And uh, we did have one question from the audience. So I, I think we, I'm going to generalize and restate what we said. So. As Dr. Elgamal said, we're not trying to make everyone in the world crypto experts here. What we're trying to do is paint the picture that cryptography forms the basis for many secure systems, uh, whether it's payments or ATMs or bank communications or personal communications. Uh, at some high level, we have to mentally divide those secure communication systems into, on the one hand, the, the ability to um, negotiate secrets between two systems that and that's involves the signatures uh, the key exchanges etc that's let's say that's one half of the crypto the other is just as data is flowing and you want to encrypt it to keep it secure provide integrity checking etc that's the where the symmetric ciphers come in uh, so if we think of those two systems as underpinning cryptography it's the the first that's at risk by quantum computing, right? M and more at risk by quantum computing, so, not so, the latter. So, so, so if, if we're talking about the digital world, you know, all digital businesses, uh, the negotiations truly happen through public key exchange of secrets. But if these public keys are broken, then you actually found the symmetric key. Then, then the symmetric key is also broken. So, you know, effectively, if I rent a very large building and put a ton of storage in it, which, you know, we're all capable of doing that these days, and I just record TLS uh, sessions, just, just record all the encrypted transactions that I care about, what we're saying is that some number of years from now, we will be able to break those and break the, the session keys because you can actually get the session key if you broke that the, the interaction between the client and the server. So it's not just about, I mean, although the signatures are important, 
uh, because as we all know, updates and, and things like that need signatures. Updating these algorithms are probably easier because they're controlled by the vendors. But updating the TLS connections on both sides is a really messy thing because every single one of billions of things need to be updated. I mean, somebody can hack into my fridge. I don't know what they would do with it. They will find how many tomatoes maybe I got or something, but they could. Uh, and maybe they would actually launch attacks from all of these IoT things. So, so the IoT things is frightening and uh, I think needs more study. I, I think the agility thing, so I'm, I'm, you know, I actually don't like it when all the panel members are agreeing. Let's say something that we disagree on. Uh, but, but the agility thing is something that we can all do right now. Let's make sure we're not dependent on a single public key algorithm. We can do this now. There are even, even NIST hasn't chosen a standard yet, but we know what these algorithms are. They, they're sitting on the site. There is implement there is actually open source implementations of every single one of them. And you know, people can pick and choose. And, and there are actually some companies that are offering experiments for uh, you know for people to come and try and see if you can make your stuff work or not. Well, Dr. Yeah. Elgamal, let me get back to you in just a second on what we can do in the world to help move ourselves towards that way. But first, let me ask a question first, Dr. Mosca, and then to you, Dr. Elgamal. And this comes from the audience. Uh, I think to the layperson, such as myself and many members of the audience, there's this feeling that quant the future of quantum computing poses a threat to break all cryptographic algorithms, all systems in the future, whether it's directly or indirectly, let's avoid the nuances there. So are there, A, how true or what's the risk of that? And B, are there algorithms being developed or systems being developed to allow us to become safe in the future? Start with Dr. Mosca. So there's no theorem or method known to break all cryptographic schemes, right? Um, so th there's different layers to this, uh, but let's just focus on asymmetric cryptography. I think most people are pretty confident we're going to have good one-way functions. So we have good encryption algorithms, good hash functions, uh, and good hash-based signatures. So let's not be that paranoid. But, you know, will there... Will, will, it, will there emerge an algorithm, quantum or otherwise, that will basically break any public key scheme? <clears throat> unlikely, very unlikely. Uh, but but we don't we don't have a proof that it doesn't exist. But you know, but maybe a more specific question is: sure, maybe there's no general purpose crypt that you know the black box that breaks anything that we ever invent. But whatever NIST standardizes in 2024, <clears throat> might that not be broken? An algorithm, sure, right? Uh, that's why we want the kind of biodiversity that Tahir is talking about and the ability to, you know, and it might just be you could switch to a new algorithm. Maybe you just need a bigger key length. I think that's the most likely scenario we live in. But of course, there is potentially, but I think this is less than a one in a thousand risk of some that there's a theorem that says actually, you know, there's public key cryptography doesn't isn't possible. <clears throat> So that's a very low risk, but it's certainly a substantial risk that any specific algorithm that is deployed is broken. And so, you know, if you're really protecting super confidential information for a long shelf life, you might want extra layers. I mean, the public key layer is great, first layer of defense. And if you're really worried about these risks, then add extra layers. You can't do it for everything, probably. It won't be practical, but you can start putting in the extra layers. There is something called information theoretic cryptography, but there's no, without, you know, with just classical tools, we don't think you can do key agreement without a public key type, uh, you know, assumption. But with quantum, you can, it's called quantum key agreement. Um, and I think it's a good second layer of defense in, for some systems. Uh, uh, it's not you know, going to be ubiquitously available. It's not as efficient and so on. That will, it'll, it ages well, to be clear. So there might be a small niche, you might call it today, where quantum key agreement can help. But over time, it will become more efficient, easier to validate, and more available. I don't think it'll ever replace conventional public key cryptography as a first layer of defense, which because it, it's really a beautiful first layer that can be applied. You can use it on a phone or you know any classical communication platform. But it's a pretty nice and emerging second or third layer of defense uh, for your more critical systems. 
Well, that's good. Dr. Elgamal, we've talked in the past about the challenges that we have faced in the industry um, over just understanding what you're using today uh, and the reticence to make changes. And unfortunately, I think we as humans hear things like, yes, quantum computing is a risk, but probably not going to break stuff. And we walk away thinking, whew, I'm safe. Smarter people than me will fix it later. Um, what are your thoughts on how do we actually make a concerted effort to be safe now and work towards that in the future? Uh, you know, I think I think the companies that that quote unquote control things need to act um, because you know the large organizations will have cryptography experts and they know how to look for things and they will understand if they have an old algorithm that they need to replace. Most people probably don't have that, but they will have equipment from vendors that actually does cryptography and they depended on it for years and. It, has worked. So, so, so the vendors that produce these things will need to move earlier, because if we want all the customers to actually be able to use, you know, imagine you're using a load balancer for or a switch or something like VPN. All of these things use cryptography, and if if we're using public key systems and and, and these devices, we need to update our customers. So, so there is sort of a that way, plus all the browser vendors and, and you know, the, the, the server vendors and these things. And, and the, 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 there is no one thing that will break everything, but we need to plan for anything getting broken. We, we never we never planned that, you know, MD5 or SHA-1 getting broken, by the way. It took, it took companies years to get rid of MD5 and SHA-1. Uh, you know, and at the time when we developed these uh, these sh hash algorithms, uh, and I mentioned those because they're kind of fresh in my head, um, it took years. And, and these digital certificates that needed renewals, and people started to ask themselves, where is my digital certificates? And nobody actually knows exactly. And, and you know, you, you can build a program in a company to find these things. So the, there are sticky elements of how we built the, the public key ecosystem and in the digital economy that actually need to be studied. And I think, you know, some number of companies need to take a leadership role to enable the, the rest of, of the e-commerce. I don't know how many trillions of dollars we run over these crypto algorithms every single day these days, but it's a lot of trillions of dollars. It's not actually a small number. And of course, the pandemic made everybody work from home. So everybody has encryption in their home on multiple devices, at least one phone and one laptop, if not more. All of that needs to be replaced. Uh, yeah, so I, I think a good summary point for the audience here is that um, if, uh, how, how can I summarize? Give me a second. You, we know that quantum computing is continuing to advance and it will pose a risk to various crypto systems. And as humans, we're both reticent to make change or we ask, we defer it to someone else like the vendors. Um, and it's, it's just hard work and it's, it's scary work. But history tells us that it's very slow for us as people or organizations to make these changes. So even though the risk is low in five years and it's moderate in 10 years, you should really uh, start your assessment now and start the planning now I mean, if you're using RSA and triple desks and low bit strength, you should have already gotten rid of that. So get rid of that. Switch to ECC. Um, assess what systems are using which crypto today and start making that advancement because uh, it won't take long before it becomes a dire threat and not just a horizon threat. Yeah, there's, there's also the, the encryption at rest thing, with, which I think Michele alluded to quickly. We try to store data encrypted when we think the data is important. Uh, and th there is specifics in the way this was done that can only be done with RSA. So you cannot actually even switch to ECC because the way the key wrapping things work. So, so there are things that are very specific to algorithms that we just designed in the past that way. You know, uh, uh, from a different angle, let me throw this, and I hope Michele disagrees because we need some disagreement <laughs> here. I think this is a very good time for people to really, really, really consider moving to the cloud. 
because cloud vendors will likely be the first group of companies that move to the new algorithms because their entire business lives online. So I'll, mo I'll, I'll partly disagree with Tahir just to uh, confirm it that way. I think that certainly uh, with any, I think what people have learned with cloud migration over the past five plus years is you don't just blindly move everything to the cloud and you don't just blindly not you know, ignore the cloud. So you have to, you know, be, be uh, you know, deliberate about what goes in the cloud and what doesn't. But I think the cloud provider. So I, I mostly actually agree with the, with the Harris saying. So my caveats are, um, they're not in the business of managing your risk. So if you're worried about long-term confidentiality, um, that, that's you have to start that conversation with your cloud providers, right? Because I think first of all, it makes it easier to help them help you. Because they have many other things, you know, they have a lot of things on their product roadmaps. And if customers, you know, it's not their job to prevent, you know, protect your long term, your secrets for long term, right? All the stuff being communicated to and from the cloud. That's your problem. If somebody records that session and decrypts the, you know, decrypts it later. So if you're worried about that, then you need to start having a conversation with your cloud providers now. Um, but I mean, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that and that for a lot of what we do, let's let, you know, uh, these central certain players take care of that for us, but we're not completely out of the woods. Like we still have to do a lot of the, a lot of the analysis. There's still some, how we connect to the cloud. There's going to be some, most large organizations, you can't just a hundred percent, you can't completely, uh, delegate this kind of responsibility. But it can certainly make a lot of the, the heavy lifting easier if you delegate, you know, if you work with cloud. But you have to then at the same time start, you, you have to engage with your cloud vendors yesterday to have the conversation about, and is it, when is this stuff going to be resilient to quantum attacks? Because now most of it isn't. Amazon, AWS, as one of its products, has a quantum safe option, but that's just one piece out of, you know, very complicated suite of, of, of services and there's many cloud vendors. So I think as a customer, you, you can't just sit back and, you know, uh, wait for everyone else to do this for you. And, and there's a question from the audience that I think Dr. Algamal fits right in with what you were saying. There was a uh, national debit switch that makes use of hardware security modules for encryption and decryption of debit card pins. So that requirement puts the burden of crypto onto some other vendor. So is that analogous to what you were, or in line with what you were saying that those vendors need to start embracing better security in the light of quantum risk? Um, this may be actually more dangerous than what we're talking about because we do not actually know which cryptographic algorithms are inside of those things. That these might be 15 years ago. <laughs> so even the symmetric cryptography in there may be broken for all I know. Uh, so I guess, I guess that's the risk of using third parties. On the one hand, you trust that they have the investment to make things safe, but on the other hand, they're black boxes and you're not sure, right? We, we need certification of things. I mean, so, so the large parties are, are going to be able to understand what is RSA versus ECC and when is AES the right thing and that kind of stuff. The rest of all companies, this, is, this covers basically every single business, um, need to have a set of questionnaires that they kind of interrogate their vendors and say, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? And, you know, I'm not a regulation fan necessarily, but, but there needs to be a representation from, you know, cloud providers is one, but, but all of the vendors of, of hardware, I mean, so debit switches is interesting um, for, for, for people in the payments industry. And I know the audience today is, is from the payments industry. Uh, you know, I think the payments industry probably would like to investigate the entire flow of payments because there are certain areas that still use triple DES for all I know. Um, you know, the ATM network, as far as I can tell, is symmetric based, but I don't know if everything got updated to AES even or not. Uh, I think it's a good time to use quantum computers as a change agent. These things should not yeah. be fixed asset. They should always be tested against the current, the current set of agreed upon standards, whatever these are. 
So, I agree. And I think if we look back to standards like FIPS 140-2 or common criteria, I think there needs to be an advancement uh, for quantum safe algorithms, cryptography algorithms, uh, something like that, to which the lay people, that's what I am. That's what I work with every day. The businesses that just need to move files around securely, we're not experts, We, but we need to have some little check mark that says, are you safe against quantum attacks? Are, are as safe as possible? Mm -hmm. I, I want to sort of reiterate the urgency to get this ready, right? What I've been, the reason I've spent so much energy trying to get be proactive is we know really well what happens if you try to rush, right? Uh, there's going to be huge losses. Like things are just, systems are just not going to work. They're not going to interoperate properly if you try to rush this kind of migration. So forget about cybersecurity. You're just, systems are just going to crash and not work and customers are going to get annoyed and, and so on and so on. And then you're going to make all sorts of mistakes that are security vulnerabilities and don't need a quantum computer to exploit. So when we start moving away from proactive lifecycle management to panic crisis management, uh, that is like a huge, potentially irrecoverable mistake for this complicated ecosystem. And we're running out of time to have sort of a, I don't want to say it's not a calm or relaxed discussion, but it's a pretty deliberate, we can work, we have to work at a very assertive pace here because these are very, you know, you have to talk to your cloud vendor, you have to talk to these complicated supply chains and so on and, and get, get ready because there's going to be some inflection points that will accelerate this very rapidly. And, I, you know, the two inflection points are, the ones coming very soon are the NIST standards that are coming. We're going to start wrapping up the shortlist 2022, 23, and then there's a process to finally wrap up the first suite of standards in 2024. So a lot of stakeholders are they're going to be ready to go to the next phase. A lot of people have been waiting or they've been testing, but we're not going to ship or deploy until we have a standard. When they have the standard, they're going to move. Like so, parts of the ecosystem are going to go to the next phase. And you're going to have laggards. Are you ready or not? Right? Because things are going to move. And I really think you need to be 75% ready, 75% of the way through your quantum safe migration at that point. And so, what does that mean? Step one is understand what all this business is, the kind of stuff we've been talking about. Step two is actually do that assessment of what it means to your bank, all your interdependencies. And step three, which is the biggest piece of all, is come up with a plan which includes the testing and talking to the standards and you know all all the different other stakeholder engagements and the last phase is the deployment right but you better be most of the way through that step three by 2024 right and you can't make up that lost time and there's going to be a mad rush for the talent who has a clue what they're talking about so there's still a little bit of time but not really any and then when Dr. Mosca, there's a question from the audience that I think is relevant here. Okay. So we know we need help. Uh, we need regulations or some kind of guidance as the practitioners in this world, the lay people in this world. So where do financial regulators or anyone in the industry, honestly, where do they go to get help? Is there government agencies? Is it your university? Where should we turn? Well, so the, the regulators. So in fact, OSFI in Canada last October, put out a, a consultation paper with some questions about the quantum. So they go to their own stakeholders to start getting, that, that's a really important group, right? The people you're regulating. Of course, you're the regulator. So, but you can also, there's a, in Canada, there's the CCCS, which provides a lot of great guidance and there's similar agencies, you know, in the United States and elsewhere. Indeed, you can go to the academic community and there's a whole host of, of companies, of SMEs, whose whole raison d'etre is to help organizations with this migration. So there's many people you can turn to for help right now because <clears throat> we're before the tornado. We're, this is where it's, we haven't crossed the chasm. <clears throat> but I think in a very short number of years, we will be in the tornado. And you're not going to have, people are not going to have as much time to help you come up with a, you know, a sound, you know, proactive plan. It's it's going to be crisis time, and if you're if you're managing this as a crisis, you failed, right? I think so. We got to avoid that. But there's a lot of people who can help today. Again, you can you start with whoever you trust the most, and then and then start going out, figuring out who else you need. But CCCCS is a great resource in Canada. 
In Canada, we have a not-for-profit called Quantum Safe Canada that I lead, which brings together these multiple stakeholders. So quantum-safe.ca. So we offer, we do a lot of advocacy and, and you know bringing together the players we need to solve the next steps. So there's a lot of great resources out there. But the next, guys, yeah. the next, um, you know, uh, inflection point will be when that fault tolerant qubit is demonstrated. Then you better, with a straight face, be able to say, "Great, congratulations, quantum computing community. We were ready for this day, and you know we're ninety percent ready, and and we're you know we're we're well on our way to do that last ten percent far before it becomes cryptographically relevant. And then people have to believe you." Anything less than that, and it, it, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of pain and a lot of losses because then people lose confidence in, in, in these critical platforms, in these critical financial systems. Because, look, people have been lied to before about all sorts of things. Look at, look at all the loss of trust in our institutions right now with COVID-19. So the trust levels in government are not exactly high. Uh, so we really need to you know, get ahead of this and be able to honestly say we were ahead of this everything's under control don't worry whenever that fault tolerant qubit is done which means you you better be well you better be you know you know just a few months away from the deployment phase all right so audience that's a big takeaway here for the dark side of payments right by 2024 you really need to be prepared for uh, these changes you can't wait until 2024 because then you enter panic and crisis mode so it starts today understanding what systems you do use, uh, how can you make effective changes to protect yourself moving forward? Because think of the last server migration you did. Think about the last time you moved a system to the cloud. Um, even those quote unquote little projects probably took you six months, a year, two years. And we're talking about changing fundamental elements of the communication systems here. I mean, these are massive changes, so start now. And on that front, Dr. Algamal, we had a question from the audience about supply chain, which I think is interesting. So we talked about vendors making things more secure. So that's kind of the vendor side of things. But as companies or as payment institutions, as, as anyone, we often rely upon various supply people in the supply chain. So are there any steps we can take there to, to ensure safety against the, uh, the advanced quantum computing attacks? Or does, does quantum computing even come into that? Uh, you know, I think the supply chain side is is now being very visible to many people because of the recent attacks. So, uh, you know, I know of a lot of places where people are revisiting every partner, every piece of software that you get from different parts and finding out, you know, how these things were, were provided and asking the questions. Uh, you know, some some places will probably, you know, to say that we support all the recent cryptography things. There will need to be tests that people conduct to make sure that statement is actually correct. So that, that's the adherence to the standards and so on. And, uh, you know, the comment that we made about hardware components that you buy from vendors is kind of part of that entire supply chain world. It's, it's just one big thing where we're really all connected. And the hard thing is, although we are in a Payments Canada conference, payments are extremely global. Uh, you know, the infrastructure in any payment processor is, is a combination of, of technology that, were, that was acquired and built from different parts of the world. So there is actually a big global part of this. Uh, we have to sort of reassess the trust that we have in, in our vendors and our third parties and so on. And, and, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember what the Y2K looked like when Y2K came. So this multiplied by a thousand, and this is the magnitude of this. First of all, we don't know. I mean, we're saying 2024, which is kind of okay, because IBM stood up and said, ah, we're going to have something, maybe Google too. But we really don't know the exact day. There's no December 31st, 2099 or whatever it was. Uh, so, so, so the planning needs to happen. And I'm, I'm repeating what, what McKelly here said, but it, we don't exactly know the timing in, uh, on any of these things. Um, 
but but uh, the risk to, to the payment system is extremely high and you know the payment system historically we've looked at the back end at the back end payment system the payment processors and banks and so on but payments today are done are being done everywhere there is a little box that i can buy from the guy down the street there that i can take payments at. what crypto does that thing have does anybody yeah, so it's, it's a challenge for consumers as well how do we know that, that that's is absolutely safe, correct so. remember consumers end up paying for everything right so, <laughs> At, at the end of the day, it's a consumer game, and and the consumers do not necessarily go to places that have POS things anymore. Most consumers pay on their phone for, you know, as much as I can tell. All right, so uh, we're running short on time. There was one other question, and I want at least a couple of minutes from each of you on the blockchain challenge. So the other question is, how do we drive change? Because we know we need change. Is this going to be some way of changing the liability calculus for software or now? supply chain hardware manufacturers? Uh, is it a government regulation? Is it voluntary certification programs? I would add, is it possibly market-driven regulations, quote unquote, like insurance, where you can't get certain insurance unless you meet qualifications? Uh, or is there something else? So just a quick one minute answer from both of you first, Dr. Algamo. So, so you mentioned blockchain and you mentioned a whole bunch of other things. Well, let's do the regular. How do we drive change first? Then we'll go back to blockchain. Uh, you know, so so money is regulated in all countries. I think I think the regulation entities in every single country need to take notice of this. I need to understand how this is going to change the way they conduct payments and how money flows within the country and across the border and all of these things. So so. Uh, you know, the, the, the regulation agencies have their work cut out for them, basically. They're not going to be able to, you know, vet every single vendor of every single piece of equipment. So, so you know, the industry needs to create something, I believe, to make sure that we're actually producing things that are, are, are good. Very good. Dr. Mosca, what are your thoughts? How do we drive change effectively? So it is a sort of a bit of all of the above. Um, there does need to be some regulatory, and I mean that in a broad sense, push to change the calculus, to internalize the risk. Because, uh, I mean, the usual way the risk is internalized is something really bad happens, then people get it, and then there's, an, then we, you know, but we, with the systemic, potentially existential threats we're talking about, we can't do it that way. So we need to proactively internalize the risk. And I mean regulate, regulation in a very broad sense. There's a lot of bad ways to try to regulate this sort of stuff, right? You don't need a prescriptive regulation aimed to absolve you of your responsibilities, right? You tick this box and you're fine, but it doesn't make you safe, but it, you know, but now you're no longer on the hook. So it is a lot about the liability calculus. It needs to be sort of accurate, right? It needs to do the accounting of the risk properly and, and get the accountability of the risk properly. You can't continue to have you know, privatized gains and socialized losses, like this kind of, we, we need regulation that kind of fixes that, but in a very principled way. And, and again, this is where you can't do that. If you do this in a crisis, you can pretty much be guaranteed it's going to be bad regulation. So I think it is important to start this discussion early and converge to, again, regulation in, in a general, I don't, I don't think this is about prescriptive regulation, but it is about creating the accountability and requiring a plan right and, and this is all a bit abstract but there's a lot of a lot of things we could do to really uh, create the proper responsibility and put in appropriate measures in a way that isn't uh you know um, too, too prescriptive and limiting excellent we got under a minute so uh, let me just quickly address the answer of bitcoin and y'all can give me a thumbs up or thumbs down someone asked what is the is quantum a real threat to bitcoin and my answer is i'll quote dr algamal from a recent discussion that we had uh, they're not going to use quantum computing to mine for bitcoins or do things on the blockchain. They're just going to use it to break into your wallet through the signatures, right? So quantum is a threat, but it's a threat in signature first before other things. Is that a thumbs up or thumbs down from y'all? It, it is the signature. I can make a transaction that says Greg just transferred a hundred thousand dollars to Tahir, and it will right. look really authentic. So it definitely is a threat, Dr. Mosca. Yeah, it's a signature is the weakest link. You can mine faster, but that worries me less because that's going to be more gradual. <clears throat> but for example, the wallets, you can steal the Bitcoins quickly if the wallets aren't quantum safe. 
And if if this threat kind of suddenly spooks us, then there's going to be complete chaos as people start moving, trying to move their money to wallets. Half of them will be fraudulent and it'll just be a big mess, right? And then there's the other ways, as, as uh, you know, Tahir mentioned, where signatures are really important and you can start hacking those as well. And it takes time to, to really uh, to, 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 to uh, design this migration into your distributed ledger platforms. Very good. Dr. Mosca, Dr. Elgama, thank you so much. Uh, everyone in the audience, thank you for attending. Quantum computing is a threat. You need to assess now. Find some good resources to prepare now because it is coming. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.